very fitting for the sermon tonight. I'm going to speak for just a little while on being sanctified. We don't hear much on this anymore. I try to bring it out as often as I can in my messages, but I have a great deal that I want to cover, and I may not get it all done tonight. I want you to turn with me, please. First, I'm going to start reading in the book of Revelation. This is something you will need. Uh, I want you to mark it. It is, it is about two verses, Revelation 18, verses 23 and 24. Then I'm going to go back. Uh, uh, I'm going over to the book of Hebrews, and I'm going to be reading from there, chapter 12. And then I'm going to read uh, three or four verses there. Then I'm going to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. I'm going to read a verse there. While you're turning, I want to read to you a letter. Now, you say, Brother Smith, how's this all, what's this all got to do with uh, uh, anything? I got a letter in the mail yesterday from a little Baptist preacher who lives in Europe. And he was writing us a letter. We've been getting mail from him for many years. And uh, he is a very, very good On his prophetic stuff, he's also a a lover of Israel and promoter of Israel. And therefore, we've over the years gotten a lot of his videos and a lot of his stuff, and we've been following him. So I know when he speaks, he speaks truth. He wrote us a letter about what's going on in Europe right now. What has that got to do with us today? Because it's a fulfillment of prophecy. I believe with all of my heart we're seeing it being fulfilled right before our very eyes. That's the very reason for the message tonight to keep sanctified. Why? Because all of these peoples from all over the world and all of their doctrines and all of their idol worship and their gods, they're bringing to America and they're spreading This darkness, instead of being in the light, we're going back into the dark ages again. And I think the church needs to wake up to where it's at. Look at itself as it's never looked at itself before. And I know that many are comfortable in their their positions of being at ease in Zion. But God said, woe unto them that are at ease in Zion. I want to read to you the letter that I'm going to read from the book of Revelation first. Here, he is talking about a Dutch politician. All of Europe, they said on the news just a moment ago, that in Europe today, as of today, over 1,300,000 people have invaded Europe in the last few months. Think about that for just a moment. That is a mighty army. Most of this is made up of young men between the ages of 18 and 30. Very few. The news media only shows little children. They want you to see the suffering of the little children. And they were showing tonight a a little fellow, just uh, maybe a year or two old, that had fell in the water and... And they fished him out and was getting the water out of his lungs. They didn't show you all of the other stuff that was going on. (coughs) Let me read it to you. Because we have the same liberal, biased news media and politicians in our country as there is in the other countries. Remember a few weeks ago I warned you when the Pope came to America what his political agenda was. His political agenda was, number one, is migrants. Everybody is going to have to accept migrants. What they are doing is they're setting up the one world government, and the spirit of Antichrist is sweeping across nations all over the world. But for some reason, America doesn't seem to be phased, just like the people in Europe But I want you to listen to what's happened to Europe. A few years ago, Europe started kicking Jews out. All over Europe, Spain, all over those countries over there, they were dispelling the Jews, telling them to go home, and the Jews have been going home. But God said, I'll curse them that curses you. 
Bless them that blesses you. So in the place of the Jews, they got the opposite. They now have Islam. They got exactly what they wanted, but it's not exactly what they want after all. Patriotic Dutch politician Jean er, Garrett Wilders called the refugees <coughs> pushing into Europe as the Islamic evasion. Uh, and during a September parliamentary debate, he commented, masses of young men in their 20s with beards are singing Allah Akbar across Europe. It is an invasion that threatens our prosperity, our security, our culture, and our identity. They shouldn't be surprised, because former Libyan leader Gaddafi said just a few months ago, a year or so ago, Islam will take over Europe without violence, force. Within a few decades, we have a few decades, 10, 20 years, maybe 30 years, we have over 50 million Muslims in Europe. I wonder how many have been slipped in into America. Just a few weekends ago, I warned you and told you that our leader has brought in I believe it was 23, no, excuse me, 13,000 over the weekend in the middle of the night slipped them in to America on planes and distributed them out to different safe cities. And they're here. They've been bringing them in by the thousands. Nobody has said a word about it. They will wait till it's too late, church, before it's being said. But let me go on. Over 50 million has come into Europe. There are signs that Allah will be, or that Allah will grant Islam victory in Europe without swords, without guns, and without conquest. The Muslims of Europe will turn it into a Muslim continent within a few decades. So, what are all of these vigorous young men going to do when they arrive in Europe? Few women travel with them. There's been a series of trials, an ongoing investigation in major British cities of Islamic sex grooming of often very young girls. While much of the same has been reported in nations across Europe, French girls are often at risk in cities like Paris if caught out in the wrong clothes and in the wrong area. Now, there are many Muslims. Some say they want peace. But listen to this man who has experienced what our leaders are crying to crown down our throats as truth. Many Muslims do want peace in a quiet life. But their religion contains exhortations to violence, and at any time they can turn to those tenets. It's being taught in their mosque. <coughs> Already, parts of major cities in Europe, from Malmo in Sweden to Marcella in France, have Muslim quarters where non-Muslims are intimidated and driven out and the police and emergency services are afraid to enter. Much of the outer suburbs of Paris are like this. And I might say it was on the news the other day. By the way, in America, we have a state called Michigan. And in Michigan, around the Detroit area, they say there's already been places set up to where the average Christian, the average white person, the average Jewish person cannot go for fear of their lives. A district of The Hague in Holland is run by unofficial Sharia law. Parts of America are being set up under the Sharia law now. While in Belgium, radical Muslim leader Abu Islam heads a group called Sharia for Belgium. He says it's a matter of time before Muslims, with their high birth rate compared to the low birth rate of the Europeans, are a majority in the country. 
And at, at that point, he hopes to impose Sharia law on Belgium. In the Daily Telegraph of London, they reported the tidal wave of Islamic immigration. Britain and the rest of the European Union are ignoring a demographic time bomb. A recent rush into the EU by migrants, including millions of Muslims, will change the continent beyond recognition over the next two decades. And almost no policymakers are talking about it. When you do talk about it, they make fun of you. They laugh at you. They tell you you're crazy. When you tell them that they're going to be moving them out, they can move them out and should move them out. We need to build a wall. They think you're crazy. They laugh you to shame or try to. But how many hundreds of thousands of these same kind of people have been slipped across our southern borders into America unknown to us? I wonder in these mosques around here how many weapons of mass destructive are already being stored and waiting on the order to let them go. Europe's low birth rate coupled with faster multiplying migrants would change fundamentally what we take to mean by Europe's culture and society. Muslims in the country now, nearly six million Islam is the fastest growing religion in post-Christian Germany. Listen to this. With many former church builder buildings being converted into mosques. And they are replacing the prayers of the saints. What few were left inside the building with the call to prayer with big loudspeakers on the outside of the building. They're publicly sounding calls to prayer from outdoor loudspeaker systems. Let me tell you something, church. In the middle of the night, during the day, when these things goes off, it will shake the bed that you're laying in or the couch you're sitting on. And they don't do it quietly either. They want the world to know what they're doing. A German document dated August the 18th of this year from a refugee refugee center in Hessen, Germany, sounds the alarm about the migrant immigrants raping the women and children. And he didn't add it, but I will add it. Also, they're having to keep their pets up in the house or in the garages or in pens to keep the Muslim men from molesting their animals. This is what kind of people that are coming and invading not only Europe, but America as well. And this is what our politicians are wanting. They clearly state that it is not incidental. It happens a lot. Women don't dare. Listen carefully, ladies. Women don't dare to go to the bathroom at night and sleep. They have to sleep in their day clothes. If a lady walks out on the street, say you went out to pick your paper up of the morning, you had your night clothes on with a robe over you, it's perfectly legal in the minds of these Muslim men to rape you, to beat you, stomp you, kick you, even take your life under the Sharia law because you were making yourself lustful to men. These little kids, they can't even go to sleep of a night in their own bedrooms, in their own houses. In Germany, a campaign called a Quran in Every Home is distributing 25 million copies of the Quran in Germany to every household. And at the same time, the media and the political establishment are attempting to silence the critics of the rise of Islam in Germany, accusing them of hate speech. By the way, how many of you have seen the new flag? 
that flies over Europe. The EU flag. It is the flag with the blue background and the stars in a circle. Thought you might be interested to know what the 12 stars. The 12 starred flag of Europe are mainly, many people are unaware that the stars are the stars of Mary, which indicates the EU's spiritual origin and base. By the way, the Muslims believe in Mary too. Now, why did I go to the book of Revelation first? Let's read it. Revelation 18, verse 23, and verse number 24. I want you to listen carefully at what's being said here. Though he speaks of Babylon and the sins of Babylon and the destruction, I believe this can be same judgment appointed to us. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. In other words, the light of the gospel. The wisdom, the understanding of the gospel is going to be snuffed out. There will be no more happiness. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations, including America, deceived. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Now, let me read and give you the definition of the word sorceries. We have an epidemic, a habitual epidemic of drugs in America. I was listening to somebody the other day. They were talking about their husband, been married for... I think 25 or 30 years, maybe longer. This man had hurt his back. He had to go have an operation. Something had happened. The doctor put him on some kind of real strong pain pill. In just a week or two, this man became addicted to pain pills. He never got deliverance because he was in constant pain. And the doctor just kept feeding him handfuls and bottles of pain pills. Then the doctor, after a while, said, I can't do it no more. The government said, you can't have no more. Now the man's addicted, legally addicted. But he can't get any more of the pill. So what does he do? He starts stealing, breaking into pharmacies. He does whatever he has to do to get his pills. Why? Because he's hooked on drugs. Sorcery. The word sorcery here, you need to write this down in your Bible. It means medications. It also means witchcraft. But it also means pharmacy. Sorceries means drugs, pharmacy, witchcraft, a poisoner, a spell-giving potion that alters the mind. And I believe the world tonight is being, their minds are being altered by drugs. So many people around the world are drugged out of their minds. They don't have the capability to make rational decisions. When I read an article like this, sane people don't allow this to happen. But there is no sanity anymore. Where is the wisdom of our forefathers? Where are the men and the women who would not have allowed the enemy to come on our shores, but we open our arms up and call us bigots if we don't? Islamophobes, haters, and all other kinds of stuff. If we don't welcome these people in. On our southern border... <clears throat> by the thousands of tons, men and women and children are ushering drugs across our border and they're spreading them out across America. Why? They're dumbing America down. The mindsets that used to fear God doesn't fear God anymore. 
our children and grandchildren that used to that used to love you now hate you. It's like they sit and look at you and their minds are numb. I was listening to one person as they were talking on the news just yesterday and they said, we have college people who are fixing to graduate from college with a four-year degree that they're just handing out by the thousands, can't even read or write their own name. High schoolers can't even read or write their own name. Some of the teachers cannot read or write their own name. Not long ago, I sat with a young man, me and my wife, and we were talking to him about getting a job. And he said, well, it's hard for me to get a job because I can't fill out an application. I said, why? He said, well, he said, I don't do longhand. I said, what do you mean you don't do longhand? I don't write. Why don't you write? Because I was never taught it in school. And I said, no, I don't believe that. So I asked my daughter. And I said, girls, tell me something. And they said, no, no, Daddy. He said, they stopped teaching longhand writing years ago in schools. That's why they have uh, computers now. They can type and they can put their stuff in. And unless you go online, and if you don't know how to go online and fill out an application, you're just out of it. So they're dumbing down our society and dumbing down America And one of the ways that they are dumbing America down is through the drugs and the pharmacies. They're building pharmacies by the thousands. You can't, they're building hospitals by the thousands. Some are closing, new ones are being built. Look on Battlefield Parkway at the new doctor's offices and new stuff that's being built. What's it got to do is most of it has to do with doctors and hospital stuff. Drugs aplenty. Some of the new stores being brought into our county is pharmacies. Why? Can't keep enough drugs to take care of everybody. You've got to feed our habits. That's why the knowledge of God is being dumbed down. That's the reason why our churches are being emptied and the Muslims by the thousands are coming in and taking over. Our churches, you say it'll never happen, go to Chattanooga. Take a drive into some of the neighborhoods where the neighborhood churches used to be there that helped keep the neighborhood together, that helped control the gang violence, that helped uh, uh, teach our children by the neighbors. Everybody loved each other. Everybody knew each other. Now, those neighbors are dying off and moving out. And they're leaving their little country churches and their little neighborhood churches. And guess who's moving in to take them over? The Muslims. Church, we need to come alive again. We need to get back into the Word of God again. We need to pray as we have never prayed before. Go with me now to the book of Hebrews, if you would please. Hebrews chapter 12, starting with verse number 12. It says, Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. This is the condition of the church. Today, weak-minded, weak spiritually, we are so weak that when we try to stand, we shake and we tremble. We don't have the strength to stand for God anymore. But he's saying, lift up the hands. Encourage the faith of the people again. Make it strong again. Make the church strong again. And the feeble knees that knock and shake. He said, make straight paths for your feet. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. But let it rather be healed. Those with broken hearts. Those with weak faith. Those backsliders and lukewarm people. He is saying, let somebody... 
carry the gospel to them. Somebody become a preacher and a teacher and an evangelist who will stand for the righteousness of God. Somebody who has separated themselves from the world and become men and women of God, established in God, somebody whose hands don't hang down, somebody whose knees are not weak and shaky anymore, but somebody who will stand in the power of the truth, somebody who will stand under the anointing power and impression of the Holy Ghost with the authority of God to go forth and preach the gospel and stand for the gospel and teach the gospel to a nation that is being done down by the drugs and by administration who hates God. Make straight paths for your feet. Preach the truth again, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. Let them stop falling by the wayside and backsliding, but let their hearts, brother, be healed. Verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness. If you go back up to verse number 10, the last sentence says that we might be partakers of His holiness. Whose holiness? God's holiness. Jesus Christ, our Savior's holiness. And he said, follow peace. That's love and unity. That is the fruits of the Spirit. Most people doesn't even know there's a Spirit anymore, the Holy Ghost. It's never been taught. It's never talked about. We don't want to talk about it. They have a form of godliness. They're ever learning, but they're never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Why? Because they're laden with sin. The lust of the flesh is so driven by the elements of this world they cannot get victory. But that is not according to the Word of God. He says, without peace and without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, carefully examining, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and there many be defiled. You never sin alone. We're living in a time when people specialize in hurting people's feelings. They never pray about what they should say or how they should act. They're not, they're not sanctified enough to control their mouth and their tongue. They're not sanctified enough to follow the spirit of peace. No, it's easier to sow seeds of discord and divide the church and destroy the church What we don't realize is that is Satan trying to use the old proverbs of divide and conquer. If we can get them yeah, yeah, amongst each other and fighting amongst each other and take the peace out of the body of Christ, then we can destroy them. But most of all, Satan says, I can control you. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. What happens is, you get your feelings hurt, you go home and talk about it. And you take that spewing of anger and hatred and jealousies and discord into your house, and that spirit walks in the house and hangs his hat on your door sits back in his big comfortable chair and said, I'm the king here now. Next thing you know, everybody in your house is fighting and fussing with each other. Oh, the new thing years ago was 
We'll just go in and divide and conquer, take a handful of this church and a handful of this church, and we'll go over here and start one of our own. Well, it doesn't work that way. Why does it not work? Because that spirit of division that you have sown those seeds of discord to get those handfuls from each place you've been, they go with you. And when you set up your church or your place of business, guess what happens? Oh, the devil will let it go on and rock and roll for a while, but after a while, that old spirit will raise its ugly head and he said, it's now time for me to take back over. You thought I'd went away, but here I am. I've just been sitting in the dark back here. I've been sitting on your front porch in your rocking chair rocking, and you ain't even seen me. I've been at ease and while you're out here doing your thing, and I've been all the time, a little bit here and a little bit there, destroying your families. Your children and your grandchildren, here's the rumbling and here's the complaining. Here are you talking about one another. They lose faith and confidence in the church, in the people in the church. And they turn themselves away. That's what he says. And hereby many be defiled. Now let's go on. I can spend the rest of the night there. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessings, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, then all of these things shall be added unto you. Listen. Go with me now to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17. I'm still preaching about a sanctified church. I may just lay the foundation tonight and have to come back and preach some more of it Sunday morning. Verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. I want to ask, is there anything hard about this first sentence that's too hard for you to comprehend or understand? I know we've got some intelligent people here tonight and some intelligent people that are watching this video. I'm not trying to bring down your mindset and dumb you down. I'm trying to ask a question to make you think, to make you relook at yourself. If there be any man in, in Christ, he is. A new creature. The key words here, any man in Christ. Listen, all things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. A new creature in Christ. A new creature in Christ thinks differently. A new creature in Christ acts differently. A new creature in Christ takes on a new character. A new creature in Christ takes on new friendships. They expel the old friends... They expel the old habits. They expel the old man. And a new man comes alive in you. When you're a sinner, you do what sinners do. You sin. But when you give your heart to Christ, 
in an instant of time, old things die and pass away. Doesn't take a week. Doesn't take a month. But in an instant, a new man is created by God. I'll give you the verse on this in Scripture in a moment. Within you. Let's read it. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Through the creative command of God, those who accept Jesus Christ by faith are made a new creation that belongs to the totally new world of God in which the Spirit Rules. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse six backs this up. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, had shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. In the face of Jesus Christ. When we were sinners, we lived in darkness. We loved darkness. That was our element in this world. Darkness is what rules in the earth. Darkness or sin is what this flesh is made out of. Now, The spirit in man, when God created Adam and Eve, He breathed into man and gave him an eternal spirit. And He made the flesh out of the dust of the ground, the elements of the earth. Man sinned. And He said, when you partake of the forbidden fruit, You shall die. The flesh shall go back to the dust from which it was taken. But inside of you is an eternal spirit from the breath of God. When you were born, every human being that is born, you are born With that breath of God inside of you. You, but now, are born because of Adam and Eve's sin. You are born in sin. Even that eternal spirit is a part of the sin nature. But, when the light of the gospel is spoken, You hear it. And by faith through grace, your faith, God's grace, I believe in Christ. And God said, I see that faith and I'll honor it. So He sent us a Savior to die for us. We accept Christ His death on the cross. His virgin birth. We accept Him three days in the grave. And on the third day, by the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost, He came up out of that grave. And because He lives, we who believe in Christ and accept Him as the Lord of our life, We now have eternal life. And this eternal life, we have to guard and watch over. Why? Because it lives in this flesh. I'm going to give you a scripture about that in a minute. And by the way, you, the child of God, are charged by God's Word To maintain 
the flesh. Keep it under control. How do you do that? By the power and the Spirit of God. When you accept Christ, you become a new creation. This old man dies. There is a new creation that takes over. But now, we need help. When I lived in sin, this flesh, being an element of the earth, lusted after the earth. Even today, this flesh still lusts after that of the earth, which is of the earth, sin. But the Bible says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world or this flesh and all of the sources of Satan, Jesus Christ, his power and spirit that dwells in me is greater than all of the demonic forces of Satan. Therefore, that's why we preach sanctification. First work of grace is salvation. Second work of grace is sanctification. The Holy Ghost is your sanctifying spirit. Remember, you still live in the flesh. It is still enticed, tempted, lured by sin of the earth. And it lusts after the things of the earth. But inside you, that new creation is not lusting after the world anymore. There's a major battle going on for your life, for your soul, eternally inside of you. Therefore, this flesh is saying, leave me alone. I just want to have peace with the world. But inside of you, the Spirit is saying, no, no. You're no longer a part of that because in you lives somebody greater than you. His name is Jesus. I'm no longer going to follow the luring and lust to the flesh. I'm lusting after the things of heaven. I know the flesh will take me to hell if I follow it. And I'm not going to be tempted and led there. And I'm not going to yield to that anymore. So I begin to pray, God, sanctify me and separate me. I want this flesh, I want my spirit to be separated from my past that caused me to be a sinner. Anything that will bring me down spiritually, I want to be sanctified of it. I want my tongue, my eyes, my ears, my feet, my hands, my heart, my mind... I want everything about me to be sanctified and separated for God's purpose. I want to take on the holiness of God. I want to be like God. When Jesus comes back, He's coming back after a church adorned in a garment that is not stained, Spotted or wrinkled from the elements of the world. A church that has been separated from the world. That's the reason he said, come you out from among the world and be you a separate people. God is the one that created the spirit man that is within you. He created the new creation. God commanded the light to shine out of the darkness. And it shined in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. As Christians, 
in an earthen vessel who at times experiences sadness and tears and temptations and trials, afflictions and perplexities or confusions, weaknesses and fears, every one of them this earthly vessel experiences. All of them can at times cause our faith to become weak. But that's where we take control of our flesh. You control the lust of the mind and of the flesh. Why? Because of the heavenly treasures that God has placed within you. (laughs) You're not defeated. You may be weak at times. We were speaking of my brother-in-law a few minutes ago and talking about through this sickness how that the devil talked to him. I too have experienced that. Many years ago when things began to go down in my body, the devil came to me and said, you're going to die. Just like he told him, you're going to die. Your preaching days is over. But God sent me a man by the name of T.L. Lowry. In a revival. Sitting right over there in that bench. From Washington, D.C. Pastoring up there. Called me one day and said, Brother Smith, I don't understand what's going on. But God told me to call you and come and preach you a week's revival in two days. I never heard of such. But I knew the man. And I said, come on, brother. We put the advertisement together. What he didn't know was the night he flew into town. Called and said, I'm at the airport. Me and my father-in-law went to get him. I got out of the emergency room thinking I was having a heart attack. My chest was hurting so bad. My arms and my back and shoulders. I thought, Well, the devil might just get me this time. But I'd already had me a bout with him and said, You ain't going nowhere and taking me nowhere till God gets through with me. Then God will release me. But not a day until then. I'll never forget Brother Lowry come up here. My, what services we had. All three of them a day. That night, he got up and he began to preach and all of a sudden he stopped. I'm sitting over here hurting so bad. My blood pressure at that time, I think, was the top number was over about 2, 250, 300. And my bottom number was close to 150, 200. Heart doctor said it's fixing to explode. The man of God stopped his message and turned around to me and he said, Now I know why I'm here. God sent me here to lay hands on you. That you could be healed. Instantly. God heal me. The devil was a liar. Jesus said he was a liar. When he opens his mouth and tells you what a failure you are, he's a liar. When he tells you you're defeated, he's a liar. When He tells you you can't do no better, He's a liar. When He tells you the drugs has got you, nothing you can do about it, He's a liar. When He says the alcohol has got you, nothing you can do, He's a liar. Hallelujah! For the Lamb of God, the truth will stand on its own merits. Greater is He. That is in me than he that is in the world. And those precious treasures that God placed within me through his Spirit, that is my strength. That is why today I sit before you 
not defeated. I can tell you from experience, sickness can make you think you're going to die. Weakness can make you think it's all over. While you're in those weakened stages, the Bible says the devil, as a roaring lion, goeth about, seeking whom he may devour. If you want to know how a lion acts, what some of these National Geographic pro- programs that old lion will lay in the weeds and grunt and groan and roar till he gets the, the herds shook up. As long as they're together, the lions can't attack. It brings confusion to them. But if they can roar loud enough and long enough and grunt till the herd begins to shake, their knees knock together, then they begin to scatter. And what happens is, that once strong unity is now broken. That unity that covered their sick. The unity that covered their old. The unity that covered their little babies and protected them from the mouth of the lion. Suddenly, in fear, they are scattered and there is no more protection. As a roaring lion going about seeking whom he may devour. The devil will become that roaring lion in your state of sickness and afflictions and weaknesses. And tell you you've lost a battle. But inside of you there is a little voice. That becomes a strong voice and saying no you're not. Doth not my word say, Ye have overcome them already, little children. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. When you have faith in Christ, you are assigned by the creative word of God. A new creation. That old man full of sin and doubt And fear dies and a new man comes alive through Christ. By the grace of God, He creates something inside of you that keeps telling you you're not defeated. It ain't over. I'm still in charge. Hallelujah. You don't have to walk around defeated. You don't have to walk around with your head hung down and your arms flopping at your side and your knees shaking and knocking. We need. No. Stand up and straighten your back. And God said, having done all to stand, When you've done all you can do, you've gone everywhere you can go. You've heard every word that you can hear. And no one seems to be able to help you. God says, just stand in your faith in Christ. You stand. Hallelujah. And when you stand in your faith in Christ, you will not, no, you shall not be defeated. Hallelujah. You're made more than a conqueror. Well, hallelujah. Because of the heavenly treasures that God has put within us, we're not defeated. Listen carefully, and I'm fixing to close. Christianity is not the removal of weakness. Nor is it merely the manifestation of God's divine power. But Christianity is you living your life, no matter your situation, sickness, defeat, sadness. You don't doubt God like Job. 
you straighten up your back and you say, woman, you talk like a crazy woman. Devil, you talk like a crazy devil. I came into this world and I'm leaving this world with nothing. God can heal me if He wants to. Though the devil slays me, I shall not turn my back on God. Though sickness destroys me, I will not turn my back on God. Though the world hates me and doesn't want to hear what I'm saying, doesn't give a hoot about what kind of condition I'm in, yet God sees me like the little bum that was laying at the gate of the rich man, filled with sores, that little man never gave up on God. Nor did he give his faith of God away. He begged for the crumbs that fell from the table and watched the dogs eat them while he was starving to death. But church, let me tell you something. In the end, when he stood on his faith and he said, God, I refuse to give up my faith and deny you, God called him home. And the next picture in this Word of God for this hero was his head was in the bosom of Abraham. But the Bible says, and the rich man that watched him lay at his gate and mocked him and laughed at him and turned the dogs out to lick his sore, he died. But in hell, he lifted up his eyes, begging God to send that old beggar now to get some water and bring and give to him. The roles had reversed. So don't you dare give up. Don't you give in. You stand strong. Having done all to stand, the devil tells you, you ain't going to get another prayer answered. You might as well give up. I told you, Jesus said the devil is a liar. When he opens his mouth... All he can do is lie. He's a liar from the beginning. Not only is he a liar, but he's a murderer. Don't believe his lies. Christianity. It's not the removal of weakness. Nor is it merely the manifestation of divine power. But Christianity. Living a holy, sanctified, separated life for Christ is the manifestation of divine power through your human weaknesses. Just seeing you walk around. A young person asked me not long ago, Brother Smith, How do you keep going on? I said, it's God. That's all I know to tell you. There's times I hurt. There's times I'm like everybody else. This flesh gets so weak. But God has never failed me. God has heard every prayer I've ever prayed, and I know it. And He's answered most all of them. The only prayer I'm waiting yet to be answered is when will He restore me to where I can stand again behind my podium and preach the gospel. But let me put you on notice, Satan. Lest you think this old gray-headed, short, fat man is weak. I still got more of God in me that can overtake you. You're just a bully, but he'll kick your butt every time you raise your dirty head. I'm not defeated, you are. Hallelujah. And when I stand before God... It is not I that's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Cast him into hell. 
but it is I that will stand before God. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I'll hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Welcome home! So, Satan, you're the defeated one. And don't you be afraid to tell him that, church. Hallelujah. When you walk around in your tiredness, your weakness, your hands are hanging down. God said, let us make some straight paths for these feeble feet to walk in. Hallelujah. Isaiah 35 tells me what that is. It is called the highway of holiness. No mean man can walk therein. Only you and God. Mm. So when I see a Christian who lives it through faith in Christ no matter what comes their way, it is then that I can see the manifestation of the divine power of God through your human weaknesses. This means that in every affliction we may be mere or more. I say that we're not mere. I say that we are more. Than conquerors. Don't get the mindset I'm just a mere, meaningless, low down Christian. No, I'm a conqueror. If I hadn't been a conqueror, I wouldn't be here today. If you hadn't been a conqueror, you wouldn't be here today. I'm a conqueror, not by my own works, not by my own power, but by the power and through the love of God. And through the abundant grace that I didn't deserve. But God looked down and somehow or another seen something in me that I couldn't see in myself. And what a difference He's made. So it's my duty to return the favor. Look unto Him, the Creator of it all. Look unto Him that no matter what problem you may have, He's sufficient in everything. For my God makes no mistakes. There is no weakness in my God. Think about His Son. They murdered Him on a cross. They watched the last drop of blood flow out of his body and mound up on the ground at the bottom of that cross. They declared him to be dead. Took him down off of the cross. They took him to a man-made grave and put him in a tomb. Buried him. Thinking he was dead. But on the third day, when they went back to find that man called Jesus, he wasn't there. The creative power of God brought him up out of that grave. Just like he's going to bring me or you up out of that grave. The church, you've got to keep your eyes on Jesus. You can't allow to happen to you what I just read in this letter is happening to the European Christians. They've turned their back on God. They quit going to church. They quit praying. They abandoned the house of God. And now the devil has moved in and took over the territory they fought and died for. Don't you give in. Don't you give up. But you keep looking up just any day now. Our Lord's returning. (laughs) 
Jesus said, when I return, will I find any faith? Well, I look around tonight and I think, wow, may not be many, but they might be a bunch more and we don't know nothing about them. They might be a whole lot more than we can even imagine. Would you bow your heads, please? Thank you, Father, for these precious, faithful people. I thank Thee, O God, for the precious Word of God that You have given us to strengthen us and encourage our faith for tomorrow, for tonight, for the rest of this week till we can come back together in this house again. And I pray, O God, that You would never let a service pass that this house is not full of Your Spirit and power. Let it not be just an empty building, but let it be filled with the angelic host from heaven. Full of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. That sanctifying power and spirit that keeps us under control. That teaches us faith. That teaches us to fear and honor God in His Word. That teaches us The end is near and warns us, be ready. Oh, that sweet anointing that brings conviction to our souls, that keeps us ready. Thank you for it. Let there never be a service of what this house is not full of your presence. Go with us now, Father. If there be one in his house that's sick or afflicted, let him be healed in the name of Jesus right now. Heal my wife and those of this church who are sick and afflicted. Send the word and the power of the Holy Ghost to them right now and raise them up. Bind the spirit of infirmity out of their flesh and heal them. In the name of Jesus, build a hedge around us, covering over us. Keep us safe from harm. Amen and amen. God bless you, church. We love every one of you. Go with God and He'll go with you. Bye-bye. And us, covering over us. Keep us safe from harm. Amen and amen. God bless you, church. We love every one of you. Go with God and He'll go with you. Bye-bye. And us, covering over us. Keep us safe from harm. Amen and amen. God bless you, church. We love every one of you. Go with God and He'll go with you. Bye-bye.